Hey! In this video, we will finally see how to construct Hochschild homology in an arbitrary symmetric monoidal infinity category. Of course, to make sense of that, we will first introduce algebras in a symmetric monoidal infinity category. And along the way, we will also discuss a little bit how to think about modules, tensor products, commutative algebras. And we will finally talk a little bit about the special case of spectra, where we have so-called topological Hochschild homology as a special case of this general construction. And we will see how this gives you a new theory for classical rings as well, with somewhat better behavior. I'm Achim Krause from Mathematics Münster. To define Hochschild homology in an arbitrary symmetric monoidal infinity category, we will first need to define a suitable notion of algebra to take Hochschild homology off. So, we define the following category. So it's an ordinary one category. written associative tensor active and it's defined as follows its objects are simply finite sets and its morphisms consist of the following data are given by a map of finite sets, S and T, together with some extra information, namely together with a total or linear ordering on each of the pre-images. So on each f to the minus 1t, right? All of these are subsets of s. We're not requiring any of these finite sets to carry an ordering themselves, right? There's really just one object per cardinality. We just require for every map to be endowed with this ordering. So in particular, for example, the set of maps from some finite set s to the one element set in this category consists of the set of all possible orderings, with, which is like there, there's n factorial many if your set has cardinality n. All right, and this is symmetric monoidal, this category. with respect to disjoint union. All right. And to get some feeling for what this category looks like, we consider the one element object. Let's write this like this. But don't confuse this with the corresponding element of, say, the category of finite pointed sets, where this would denote the, element, the, the two element set, where you have like one non-base point element. But I'll still stick to this notation because I guess square brackets would also suggest a two object element. Yeah. This is the one element set. So note that in this category, as tensor active, this object is an associative algebra object. So, what does this mean? Well, it comes with a multiplication map, right? There's a map from the two element set to the one element set, which just 
is the constant map and then takes the the ordering which has like the left guy smaller than the right guy on the fiber. And we also have a unit map, right? The monoidal unit is the empty set and we of course have a map like this. All the pre-images are empty so there's no, there's no additional data through this total ordering thing. So this looks like a unit map and a multiplication map in an algebra, right? With respect to the monoidal structure we chose. And there's some diagrams that need to commute in order for this to define an associative algebra object. For example, the two different ways to multiply together three copies of your object need to agree. But both composites here simply correspond to the constant map with the the ordering where the left guy is the smallest and the right guy is the largest, right? So this commutes and similarly you can check that it, the multiplication is also unital. So this really defines an algebra object. And in some sense this symmetric monoidal category behaves like it's kind of the, the free symmetric monoidal category on one algebra object, right? We need to have a unit and we want our algebra object, but all the other objects are simply disjoint unions, right? They're simply obtained as ten, uh, by the monoidal structure from, from this algebra object. And if you think about it, all the maps simply correspond to all the ways you can kind of multiply together copies of, of an algebra object. So with that in mind, we make the following definition. An associative algebra in a symmetric monoidal infinity category is given by a symmetric monoidal functor from the nerve of this symmetric monoidal one category, which then is a symmetric monoidal infinity category, to C. Right, and the way to think about this is that the underlying object of such an algebra object represented by a functor like this is simply the value at this element one. Right, so the algebra structure is somehow encoded in how all the structure maps act, right? All the, all the other finite sets are simply disjoint unions of this guy. So they're all sent to tensor products of the, the underlying object. And then all the induced maps encode somehow not only a multiplication map, but also, for example, they witness that it's associative and so on. And they do that in a coherent way, right? I mean, this is an infinity category, so you can't really say that these composites will be equal in C, but rather this diagram here will give you a preferred homotopy between the two composites. And then there's going to be higher diagrams as well that give you all the higher homotopies. And so this is a way to make precise this sort of vague intuitive idea that in this infinity world an associative algebra should have all these kinds of higher coherences, right? They're simply encoded in the nerve of this one category. And as a good exercise at this point to, to get a feeling for how this works, you should really check that if C is 
the one category of abelian groups with monoidal structure given by the tensor product that in that case the data of such a functor is the same as a ring. So in fact there, there's an equivalence of categories between symmetric monoidal functors from this associative tensor active to abelian groups and the category of rings. There's no, nothing special about abelian groups here. Generally this also characterizes algebra objects in a one category. So having defined what algebras are, now the next idea is, that the next question is, how would we define Hochschild homology? And we want to do that in the same way, right? We want to just write down a cyclic bar complex as we did a while ago for just ordinary rings and take the realization of that. But it's hard to write down a simplicial diagram in an infinity category sort of by hand because um, you, you give me a number of objects, you give me some maps, but then there are some identities that need to be fulfilled and so you need to give homotopies for those and so on. So that's not something you can do by hand. So we should try and make this category that just did the coherence work for us in the case of just defining what algebras are. We should try to make, to, to have that make, uh, do, do the work for us as well in kind of taking care of the coherences in the cyclic bar complex. So in order to capture the combinatorics of the cyclic bar complex, we define for a totally ordered set S what we call the set of cuts. So a cut of a totally ordered set you should really imagine as cutting it in two halves. So one way to think about this is that it consists of a partition S0, S1 into two subsets. So S0, S1 are subsets of S and we want S0 to be smaller than S1. So all elements of S0 are smaller than all elements of S1 in the total order on S and we want them to form a partition. Right, so in particular they're disjoint, so this is really, the, the picture you should have in mind is really I have my totally ordered set and I slice it into two pieces at some point. And so in there we have kind of two very extreme cuts where one of the guys is empty and the other one is everything. We will call those the trivial cuts and we can form the closely related cyclic set of cuts which is just the thing where we've identified these two. Okay, this might seem somewhat mystical but just observe that these are both contravariant, right? So if I have a map from S to T and I have a cut on T, I can take pre-images and I get a cut on S. And this sends the trivial cuts to the trivial cuts, so it also respects this quotient. And so this is a contravariant functor from the category of, let's say, finite non-empty from the category of finite non-empty ordered sets to the category of sets, right? And since it's contravariant, this defines a simplicial set, right? Finite, totally ordered, finite non-empty totally ordered sets is just a description of the category delta. So to get a feeling for what's going on, what kind of combinatorics these two things capture, you should try and check for yourself that the first of these simplicial sets is really just a funny description for the simplicial set delta 1. And this is simply a funny description for the simplicial S1, which is obtained from delta 1 by quotienting by its boundary.
So the relevance of this funny description here is that we can see that this functor cut sick does not just go to sets. So cut sick even defines a functor from delta op to this category associative tensor active. Right here, the objects were simply finite sets and the maps had some extra structure. So of course there's a functor that just forgets the extra structure, just gives you, like just gets you into the ordinary world of sets. So such a functor has an underlying simplicial set. And so we're saying that somehow the simplicial set here, which we just claim to be S1, has this funny additional structure. And in this description, that's really nice to see. So we need to produce total orderings on the pre-images of all the simplicial structure maps. So for a map of totally ordered sets and a cut S0, S1. So this is supposed to be an element of cut sick S. So in the case of the, the one like two element uh, equivalence class, of course, this could be either, just say it's a representative. Then we, we want to look at like the, the induced map F upper star it goes from cut sig on T to cut sig on S. So it makes sense to ask what the pre-images of this cut on S are in, in the, uh, in, in the cyclic cuts on T. All right, so this is F star to the minus one of this cut S0, S1. This is a subset of cut sig T. And what is this? So this naturally falls into two different cases. So if this is not a trivial cut. So both sets are non-empty. Then the pre-image consists of So is given by all cuts on T between the image of S0 and the image of S1. Right? It's, it's a little confusing because there's so many contravariant stuff here. But if you think about it, what does F upper star do? It simply takes a cut on T and pulls it back to S. So if that's supposed to be your original cut, then you better were cutting between the two images. But you can cut wherever. The pre-image of your cut doesn't change. So each of these cuts between them is going to be taken by F upper star to the given cut. So that's the one case. What do we do in the case where we're in the trivial setting? Right there, there between doesn't make sense, especially since we have to write something down that's well-defined. Uh, or we, 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 we want to get something that's well-defined uh, for this. So 
if you think about it a little bit, if you take a cut on T and you pull it back along F and it becomes a trivial cut, then you were either cutting to the left of the image of S or to the right of the image of S. So if S0, S1 is the trivial cut the from the equivalence class of trivial cuts, then uh, is given, the pre-image is given by all cuts outside of the image of S. Sorry. So we need to put an ordering on these pre-images such that the uh, such that it's comp uh, compatible with composition. And here, here's the funny the funny way, way this goes is that somehow in the first case you really simply order the cuts from left to right. But in the second case, you have these kind of this, this cut comes to you as a union of two sets, right? There's the cuts to the right of f of s and there's the cuts to the left of f of s. And the way you order this is you first go through all the cuts to the right and then you go around and you do the rest of the cuts. And this is, this should remind you of say uh, what we did in the cyclic bar construction where somehow some of the structure maps took something from the right all the way around. So maybe, maybe this is not too surprising. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of cool that this works out. So what we have now described is we have described a functor from delta op to this category associative tensor active. Algebras are simply functors from associative tensor active to a given category. We wanted to get a simplicial diagram, right, the cyclic bar complex. So now we can compose those two and we really get a functor from delta up to the category we started with for any algebra. So this is what we do. So for an algebra, which remember is simply a symmetric monoidal factor from this associative tensor active to C, uh, we define the Hochschild homology, or maybe I should say the Hochschild object. And we'll write this as A relative C. As simply the co-limit over delta up of the composite. Right, I have this functor cut sick from delta up to this category associative tensor active and then my algebra is just a factor to C and I can form, this gives me a simplicial diagram, I can form the co-limit and maybe you should think about this as kind of the, the way to form geometric realizations in this infinity categorical world. So lemma for A an ordinary ring or the, oh, let me say for, for an ordinary ring or more generally a DGA we have an algebra A in DZ. 
so this is using something like uh, that the functor from chain complexes to DC is lax symmetric is lax monoidal, and uh, that lax monoidal functors take algebras to algebras. So what we're claiming now is that the Hochschild homology of this algebra formed as above in this category DZ agrees with the Hochschild homology of just the, uh, the ring or DGA we started with. So let me write this like this. And when I write this, I mean as we previously defined it, right? Replace by like a flat DGA and then literally take the cyclic bar complex and then the total complex of that. Right, so how does this go? Well, as I said, the, the, the fact that somehow ordinary rings give you algebras in this derived world, that's, a, that's somehow a little lax monoidal technology. Let me not go into that, but uh, maybe, yeah, let me not go into that. The interesting part is how, how, how do these things compare? And so it turns out that the factor from chain complexes to DZ actually preserves tensor products of k flat uh, chain complexes, which I guess over z just means uh, level wise flat. Yeah, well, let, me, let me write k flat. k flat uh, complexes. Right, this, this should correspond to your intuition that the, the monoidal structure on DZ is simply the derived tensor product and that you can form derived tensor products underlying. And so if we take our DGA simply, uh, so if, we, if we take it to be K flat, since we know that both sides only depend on A up to quasi-isomorphism. I mean, for, for this one, we proved that at some point, or I guess we, we defined it by picking a replacement, but then we showed that it's well-defined. And for this one, it's just clear, right? This is intrinsically defined in terms of the infinity category. So it uh, doesn't even make sense to have something not depend, like not be invariant under quasi-isomorphism, right? Quasi-isomorphisms are just equivalences in here. So if we take our DGA to be K flat to begin with, then uh, this factor from chain complexes to DZ preserves all the tensor products in the cyclic bar complex. And now, of course, the crucial ingredient 
is that the simplicial diagram that you get by this composition here, that that is really looking like the cyclic bar complex. So in particular, we're claiming that if you input a DGA or say ordinary ring, then it's level wise simply like in, in level n, it's just going to be n tensor products and the simplicial structure maps are really given by multiplying the corresponding things together. So in a way, this is something that comes from the fact that on this, in this category as tensor active, if you think about what the simplicial diagram cut sick looks like in there, you can see that it is the cyclic bar complex on, or like the cyclic bar construction on this object that I wrote as angle brackets one earlier, the, the, which we saw is an associative algebra object in that category. So you should convince yourself that that is true, that somehow this, the combinatorics of this cut sick is really that of the cyclic bar complex. And then, once we know that, so that this, this functor actually takes the Hochschild complex as we previously defined it, or like the, the simplicial diagram giving rise to the Hochschild complex, to the simplicial diagram giving rise to this guy, it boils down to uh, some standard lemma that so then we use that uh, in TZ uh, co-limit of a simplicial diagram is computed if it comes from the category of chain complexes by a total complex. So now that we have generalized Hochschild homology in this way, we can form it in other symmetric monoidal categories. And kind of the, the reason why we're doing all this, the main reason is that we want to do this in spectra. So for a ring spectrum, and that's simply a word for an associative algebra in the category of spectra, we define topological Hochschild homology of A as the Hochschild homology of A formed in this category of spectra. And now, I guess a priori this might look like something super exotic because, I mean, you're getting the spectrum out fine, but you have to input like an algebra and spectra where you're getting that from. But it turns out you can immediately apply this to ordinary rings. Why? So for an ordinary ring, R, we have the eilenberg maclane spectrum HR, right? This is the spectrum which has just one homotopy group, namely pi zero given by R. And it's uh, actually uh, completely, so the, there, there's a functor H from rings to spectra, which gives you this. So this is very natural. 
And it turns out that that functor is like symmetric monoidal. So for a ring, so you can do this for abelian groups more generally. So right, you have a functor from abelian groups to spectra, which gives you the allenberg mclean spectrum. It's like symmetric monoidal. And so it will take rings to associative algebras. So this is canonically a ring spectrum. And so we can form THH of that. And there's a slight overload of notation that people do there typically, which is that they simply write THH of R for THH of this ring spectrum R. And so informally, or I guess the, the way you should think of this, I say informally because somehow, as I said, you can't simply write down the simplicial diagram in terms of objects and maps and then be done with it in, in an infinity category. But you should think of this really as we have this ring spectrum and we write down the simplicial diagram of spectra given by the cyclic bar complex and then we geometrically really realize that which uh, is obtained by taking the co-limit. And we'll see later a little bit about how this behaves for ordinary rings at this point, this is very mysterious to us, right? We don't know a lot about the monoidal structure in spectra yet. And in particular, this is not going to be just an eilenberg mclean spectrum again. So this factor H, it's not strictly monoidal, it's lax monoidal. So this is a little mysterious right now, but of course one example that we can already give for THH in general, it's kind of the other example. So this, we, we have this einberg mclean spectra. The other example of a ring that we definitely have is the unit, the monoidal unit itself, right? That's always an algebra in every category. The factor from associative tensor active is simply a constant factor in that case. And so here we have uh, that we can form THH of the sphere spectrum. And in that case, so if, if you look at the cyclic bar complex of the unit itself, all the levels are simply like tensor powers of the unit. So all the levels are simply the unit, it's a constant simplicial diagram. So the co-limit is again going to be just that object. So THH of S is simply S. It's maybe not too surprising because it's analogous to how Hochschild homology of the unit, which was in that case the integers, z. How Hochschild homology of z relative z is simply just z, right? So this is kind of a version of that. Maybe this also motivates already that you can think of THH as somehow Hochschild homology relative the sphere spectrum. We'll see in a second how to think about that a little more precisely. All right, so from now on we will need to talk a little bit about algebras and that also involves, of course, as a usual algebra, it involves modules and tensor products. So we'll do a little interlude or little excursion and see how variants of this associative tensor active trick can also be used to define what left and right modules and their tensor products are.
So we define a category L mod tensor active with so it's again a one category. It's going to have objects given by finite sets as before, but now there's somehow each element also carries a label. So So with elements labeled or colored uh, by two colors, which we're just going to denote A and M. I, we're going to have variants with more colors later, so I don't want to start on like red and blue, otherwise it's going to be confusing. What was red again? What was blue? What was green? Let's just call them A and M, and these will stand for algebra and module in a second. So, uh, of course, what this precisely means that an object is given by a finite set together with a map to this two element set AM. Right? That, that's what it means to pick one of these labels for every element. And now maps are simply maps again together with a total ordering on each pre-image and composition is still in this lexicographic way uh, but now there's a condition, two conditions pre-images of A colored elements are completely L completely A colored. Right? So so it never just the like if I if I have a set where something is M colored and I map that to a set where something is A colored, then for example, there is just no map fulfilling that, right? So, so a lot of mapping spaces here will be empty. So pre-images of A colored elements are completely A colored and pre-images of M colored elements are uh, such that they contain precisely one M colored element and it is uh, the maximum. So there's exactly one M colored element and it's all the way to the right. And for an analogous category, R mod tensor act, we have minimum instead. So it's the same construction, but we want the M colored element to be on the far left. And of course, this just corresponds, what we're capturing here is somehow, if you have some algebra and a module in some sort of free setting, nothing except the, the algebra structure and the module structure and the monoidal structure of the ambient category, then you can form all kinds of tensor powers and tensor products of your algebra and your module. But if you think about what kinds of maps you have, they're precisely these kinds of maps. You can take a bunch of copies of A and multiply them all together. And you can take a bunch of copies of A and one copy of M and multiply them all together to M provided you're kind of multiplying from the left, right? You only have a left module structure. So, with this definition, a left module in 
an infinity category C is a symmetric monoidal functor. L mod tensor active to C. And note, I haven't said a left module over an algebra A. I've just said a left module because, of course, this symmetric monoidal functor is going to encode both for you, right? It's going to send the M, like the, the single M colored element to some object. It's going to send the singleton A colored element to another object. And the structure maps give the A colored guy the structure of, a of an algebra in the previous sense and then the m-colored guy a module structure over that algebra. So the underlying algebra, uh, let, me, let me just say that in words because uh, I'm running out of space, but the underlying algebra is simply obtained by restricting to the full subcategory on a-colored elements. Right, if you think about it, if you just have A-colored elements, then this is simply a copy of associative tensor active. So there's a subcategory associative tensor active in here, and if you restrict, you get the underlying algebra. And in particular, if you want to talk about the category of left modules over a fixed algebra, you, you'll take the fiber of a suitable restriction map over one object. All right, so that's how we can encode modules in this funny way. And now I would argue the main thing that you're doing with modules in ordinary algebra is one of the main things is that if you have a left module and a right module over the same algebra, you can tensor them together and just get an abelian group. So what, what should this work like here? And the trick is going to be the same as that we did for, for the cyclic bar complex. We're going to write down somehow like a, a free world with a left module, a right module, and an algebra, and we're going to write down a bar complex in that world, and that free world will be a one category, so we can just do it. And then functors out of that free world will simply encode an algebra together with the left module and the right module, so if you give me that kind of data, you, you get a functor for free and you get a simplicial diagram like that. Simply how, like similarly to how once we wrote down the cyclic bar complex in associative tensor active by this cut sick construction, any algebra just gave us a simplicial diagram by post composition. So the way we can do this is we can define a category so I'm going to write LR mod tensor active, but this is not something like a bimodule. This is supposed to encode like the theory of a pair of a left module and the right module over the same algebra. So uh, this has objects given by finite sets with a colors as before, R, A, L, standing for an R module, uh, a right module, an algebra, and the left module, and maps are uh, maps of finite sets with ordering on pre-images and uh, pre-images 
of a colored elements are a colored and pre images of R colored elements have precisely one R colored element at the minimum and the rest is A colored and analogously for uh, L with the maximum. Right. And note here that somehow the there are simply no, like the pre-image of an L-colored thing never contains an R-colored element and similarly the other way around. So from that one can check, with a little work, that a symmetric monoidal functor from LR mod Tensor act to a category C is precisely a pair of functors L mod tensor act to C, R mod tensor act to C by restricting to the full subcategories where I just have these colors A and L or just have these colors R and A and uh, which agree on the copy of as tensor active which sits in there as the, the full subcategory on all things where which are which have just the color A, or all the elements have the color A, right? So this really encodes a pair of left module and right module and uh, so over the same algebra. So the other way around, if someone gives you a left module and a right module over the same algebra, you get a functor like this. And in terms of that functor, we can now write down the bar construction, the two-sided bar construction, right? Because this is a one category. So in there, we can simply write down a simplicial diagram without worrying about coherences. And the simplicial diagram, I claim we already saw the combinatorics earlier. So how do we define the tensor product if n is a right module and m is a left module? This is the, the, the co-limit of the composite delta up to LR mod tensor active to C where this functor is given by this, this triple of left and right modules over the same algebra in, in this way down here. And this functor, well, this is just our functor cut from earlier, not cut sick, just cut. And how does this work? Well, you can check that if you, right, remember this cut S was just the set of cuts on S. And it turns out if you simply color the leftmost cut as R in this sense, 
and the rightmost cut as L and all the other cuts as A, then this cut really defines a functor into this LR mod tensor active. So this is a simplicial diagram that we get for free once we've specified left and right modules and over the same algebra and then we can realize it. And it's really the realization of the two-sided bar construction. So this, this does generalize, for example, the usual like, derived tensor product in like DZ. If you have an algebra in DZ, say coming from an ordinary ring, and left and right modules coming from ordinary left and right modules, then if you form this kind of tensor product in DZ, by this construction, it's the same thing as the total complex of the two-sided bar construction, which is the derived tensor product. Okay, and of course there's all kinds of variants. Let me mention two, so we can also do bimodules, either over two different algebras or over one algebra. Let me talk about the case where we just have one algebra. Uh, where we again have colors AM, but uh, pre-images of M colored elements have uh, precisely one M colored element, but other than what we said for left or right modules, we have that element anywhere. And the relevance of this for us is that uh, cut sick actually factors through the resulting category bimod tensor active by introducing the coloring where you simply give the M color precisely to the equivalence class of the trivial cuts. Now you can check that the, the pre-image of the trivial cut contains precisely one trivial cut, like one, precisely the equivalence class of the trivial cut ones. So, uh, there is a version of Hochschild homology. Let me write that Hochschild homology of A in C, but with coefficients in M for a bimodule M. That's sometimes uh, interesting. And of course, if you plug in the algebra itself as this bimodule, you recover the original thing. This is, uh, I guess, yeah. This corresponds to um, putting on the cyclic bar complex one factor of m in each degree and the structure maps uh, are such that you either multiply this guy onto m from the left or the like there's one structure map which takes this guy around and multiplies it onto m from the right. Okay, and then finally, there's also, of course, all of this was associative. And I can also say a little bit about the commutative case. Uh, 
So for the commutative case, there is a com tensor act that one can write down. But it actually turns out to have a much simpler description. It's really just a category of finite sets. And if you think about it again from this perspective that somehow this associative tensor active was kind of the free symmetric monoidal category on one object with an associative multiplication. So all the maps simply consist of multiplying together copies of this A, but you have to remember in which order. This is where the ordering on the pre-images came from. Then here, all the objects are simply going to be copies of your tensor powers of your, sorry, tensor powers of your commutative algebra, and all the maps are simply obtained from multiplying together things, but since the order doesn't matter, you only have to remember which things went together. So this is why this is a category of finite sets. And then analogously, there's this definition of a commutative algebra in an infinity category C simply being a factor from this com tensor act, or I guess fin, uh, where you have to be a little careful, I guess, to be 100% precise. I should have put the nerve here, but uh, I guess something we sometimes did and will continue to do is that the, the, the nerve, since it fully faithfully takes one categories to infinity categories, we sometimes drop it. Let me maybe put the, the nerve here. Right. And I guess in what follows, we will somehow use modules and algebras a little more freely than up until now. So there's a lot of variants. For example, if you have modules over commutative algebra, then the modules are still defined in the same way, but they turn, it turns out that left modules and right modules are the same because somehow for, for similar reasons as in the usual setting where like if you're commutative, it doesn't, like you, can, you can kind of form an opposite uh, module structure. And uh, there's other things happening. For example, while in the associative case, the tensor product did not have any structure left. It was really just an object of C. If you are over a commutative ring and you have two modules and you tensor them together, then you still have a module structure on that. So we'll not, we'll not derive all these things, but uh, the, the general intuition is that most of the things you can kind of do categorically with like manipulating tensor products and so on still work here, although they're a little harder to, to prove rigorously. So one, one of the things that follows from somehow general facts about commutative algebras that will be kind of important for us is that for a commutative algebra, the Hochschild homology again has a commutative algebra structure. And I'll not prove that uh, because it uses some facts about commutative algebras, but the, the main ingredient is that every 
level of your simplicial diagram has a commutative algebra structure. It's just a tensor power. And then it turns out that co-limits of shape delta op, so geometric realizations of commutative algebras are formed underlying. So the other way around, the co-limit of the underlying objects is the underlying object of the co-limit in commutative algebra. So this co-limit here has a commutative algebra structure. So we get ring structures on most of the examples that we care about. For example, the, like if we start with a commutative ring, these eilenberg maclean spectra, HR, that we saw earlier when we discussed THH, are not just algebras, they're commutative algebras. And so THH of an ordinary ring, i.e. of the eilenberg maclean spectrum, is actually, again, a commutative algebra in spectra. So its homotopy groups have a ring structure and so on. Okay, so finally we want to study Hochschild, topological Hochschild homology of ordinary rings a little bit more closely. And the first ingredient is that we can actually compare that with Hochschild homology through a certain range of degrees. So, einberg maclean spectra are a generalization, or like our special case of a functor H from DZ to spectra, right? So if you take an ordinary abelian group and you view it as a discrete complex in here, then H of that is going to be H of your abelian group, the corresponding einberg maclean spectrum. But it turns out that uh, you can do that for any complex. And of course, the, the, the functor comes from the dot Kahn correspondence somehow. Um, and its main property is that the homotopy groups of HC are simply the homology groups of C. Right, so this is kind of suggestive notation. So, as we said before, this functor is actually, or we said something slightly similar earlier, but it turns out this functor is lax symmetric monoidal. And so, and uh, sorry, and it also preserves co-limits. It's actually uh, yeah, preserves co limits, and so a can we get a canonical map from. THH of HR to H of the Hochschild homology of R. Right, if you think about what, what does it mean to be lax symmetric monoidal, in particular, you get maps from stuff like HA tensor HB to H of A tensor B. And so just think of the fact that you'll have a map like this on each level of the cyclic bar complex. And then you take co-limits on both sides, but if H commutes with co-limits, then you get a map like this. So for abstract reasons, we have this map. And on homotopy groups, so we didn't introduce that notation earlier, but of course, similar to how 
the Hochschild homology groups are defined as the homology groups of the Hochschild complex. Uh, the topological Hochschild homology groups are defined as the homotopy groups of the spectrum. So on homotopy groups, we get in particular a map from THH star HR to HH star R. Right, so there is a funny comparison map for this topological Hochschild homology of an ordinary ring and just ordinary Hochschild homology. And in fact, there is a slightly nicer perspective on what's going on, which is why I introduced tensor products, which is that this factor actually factors through an equivalence of infinity categories dz to modules over hc. And I guess technically I, I should put L mod or R mod here, decide for some direction, but of course hc is a commutative algebra, so the two categories are naturally equivalent. And, uh, so usually people drop the direction at that point. Uh, and this is symmetric monoidal with respect to the monoidal structure here that's tensor product over hz right as i said before uh, in over a commutative algebra the tensor product still has a module structure and it turns out that this can be improved to really like a symmetric monoidal structure on this infinity category so in this perspective, you should think of H of HHR, the right-hand side here, as simply Hochschild homology of HR in the category mod HC. So a more informal way of writing that would be by kind of cyclic bar complex relative HZ, where you take just tensor products over HZ in each degree. And one other way to write that would maybe simply be just THH of HR relative HZ, right? The, the T here just sort of for good measure because we're really like, we're working in spectra, but we're working relative a different base. And in, in this notation, of course, uh, the usual tensor product, right? If you look at what just THH of HR would have been, there we would have taken just tensor products over the sphere, right? Because the sphere is the unit and just the absolute monoidal structure is the same as just tensoring over the sphere, right? In, in a symmetric monoidal category, every object is canonically a module over the unit. So, So the difference between Hochschild homology and topological Hochschild homology from this perspective is what base we work over. And in particular, analyzing this map here should have something to do with like figuring out the difference between tensor products over S and over HZ. So one example is the following. If R is a Q algebra, 
then this map THH star R to HH star R is an isomorphism. This follows from the following fact, namely, you take the sphere spectrum and you tensor it with HQ, then this turns out to be the same as taking HZ and tensoring with HQ. Of course, this side is simply HQ, so it just has homotopy in degree zero. This side, a priori, has higher homotopy groups, but they have something to do with the rational homology of, of this eilenberg mclean spectrum. And it turns out you can check that the higher homology groups of eilenberg mclean spaces, or like eilenberg mclean spectra, sorry, are always, of this eilenberg mclean spectrum are always torsion. So this is also just Q concentrated in degree zero. So these two things are equivalent and uh, in particular this means that S tensor HR is equivalent to HZ tensor HR uh, for a Q algebra. And then You think about these two different ways to form tensor products. If you just write these as realizations of bar complexes, then in here you have in each level a copy of a, two copies of HR with a whole bunch of copies of S between them. Here you have two copies of HR with a whole bunch of copies of HZ in between them. But from this fact, you see that you can replace all the HZs by S. So these are equivalent after taking co-limits and similarly higher tensor products. So by playing a little bit with tensor products, you see that like from this fact that rationally S and HZ are equivalent, all, everything that goes into, into the cyclic bar complex either relative S or relative HZ gives the same thing in that case. Of course, if it works well over Q, then it's probably not going to work well away from Q. Um, so what do we get for general ordinary rings? So for a classical ring, R, this map THHIR to HHIR uh, is an ISO for I smaller or equal to surjective for I equals three. So there's some connectivity statement for this comparison map. And for the proof, we use that the fiber of the map from THHR to and I guess now let me write this as, let me simply write HHR. I'm overloading a little bit. This, this now denotes the spectrum H of HHR, but uh, 
It's the standard way of viewing a chain complex as a spectrum. So the fiber of this map is the geometric realization or co-limit of a simplicial diagram of uh, the form where I have the fiber from just hr to hr in degree zero. Right, so or maybe maybe I should put THH HR and THH HR relative HZ. That's the, the closest to the perspective we want to employ in the proof. But of course, by what we said earlier, this is a spectrum whose homotopy groups are the Hochschild homology groups, and this map induces this comparison map. So in the lowest degree we have this fiber. One degree higher, we have the fiber of HR tensored over S with HR to HZ tensored, oh, sorry, HR tensored over HZ with HR. And then it continues. And let me not get into the full details, but of course, the bottom stage, the fiber here, this is just zero. So this guy is zero. And these other guys, these, it turns out, are uh, all um, two connective. So their first non-trivial homotopy group sits in degree two. And uh, that comes from an analysis of the connectivity of the map from S to HZ, right? In other words, some understanding of like the first non-trivial homotopy group of S, which is in degree one, and then how this, how this influences these things. Maybe, yeah. So the, the way one can do this is one can resolve R just as a Z module by a resolution, and then therefore you reduce this connectivity statement here uh, to the case where R is just a sum of copies of Z and then uh, to the case where R is just Z itself. And so in the end it boils down to a statement about the homotopy groups of HZ tensored over S with HZ, which are like homology groups of einberg maclean spectra again. So if this guy is zero and these guys are all two connective, then uh, for example, by an argument with like some kind of skeletal filtration, there's like a filtration on these things, uh, you can check that somehow contribu contributions to homotopy groups uh, come from like the bottom term and then the suspension of the first term and then the second suspension of the second term and so on. So in total, it follows from that, that somehow if all these terms are three connective and this guy is even zero, that the realization will be three connective. And once you have that, well, when we say the fiber of this map is three connective, that's exactly this kind of statement by the long exact sequence on homotopy groups, right? It's exactly giving you a statement of the form that the map is still surjective in degree three and an ISO in degrees below that.
Okay. So in low degrees, very low degrees, we now understand THH, right, of, of ordinary rings. This does tell us that, for example, in degree one, it will have to do something with Kähler differentials. And uh, so let us look at kind of the most important example, right? In the rational case, we, we said that we understand what's going on, uh, that these things just agree. So if we understand the rational case, the next thing to look at should be FP, right? A single characteristic at a time. And so what happens for FP? Well, for FP, we see that THH2 of FP is HH2 of FP. And this in turn, well, that we computed, right? Remember, HH of FP was FP in each even degree. And the product structure was this funny, like, divided polynomial structure. But uh, once we know this, well, this gives us a canonical description of this, right? We, we had some computation for HH2 that gave us a, a, a certain generator, which we called X back then. So we now have like a preferred element in here. And so it makes sense to ask, for example, can we express the higher degree groups still in terms of x? And remember, THH for a commutative ring has this product structure. And so it turns out, this is kind of the most important fact about THH, in my opinion. which is that THH of FP has homotopy groups simply polynomial in X. So it's concentrated in even degrees. It's also FP in each even degree, just like HH. But the multiplicative structure is far nicer. Generators in degree 2K are simply given by the kth power of X. And so note in particular that the map you get from the polynomial ring to this divided polynomial algebra is actually zero in degrees bigger or equal to P. So if you think about our original motivation for why to study these things, which is that they're recipients for trace methods, for these invariants coming out of K-theory, then you see that somehow this guy is already possibly a better recipient for your invariant. Because if you have an invariant that factors through THH, then for FP at least, it's just going to be trivial in HH, like no matter what it did, it's going to be trivial in degrees two, bigger or equal to P after post-composition with this. So this, this, out, this, this kind of highlights the importance of THH as like a refinement of Hochschild homology. Okay, that's everything for today. Thanks for watching, see you next time.